welcome to our closing session for the day. Uh, and I think this will fall into the category of, and now for something completely different. Uh, we are pleased to have with us, to welcome back Dan Trelaro and to welcome um, Chris Farrell. Chris uh, is Senior Economics Contributor at Minnesota Public Radio and uh, also for Marketplace, which is American Public Media's nationally syndicated public radio business uh, and economics pro economic program. Um, his voice will no doubt sound very familiar to many of you. And, uh, you know, I think it's always interesting when you meet a radio person to actually be able to put a face to the voice and see how much it is like what you were expecting. Um, he's a columnist for Market Watch, uh, for uh, PBS Next Avenue, and the Minneapolis Star Tribune. He's written for Bloomberg Business Week, The New York Times, Kiplinger's, and other publications. Also the author of five books, uh, the most recent being Purpose and a Paycheck, Finding Meaning, Money, and Happiness in the Second Half of Life. Uh, Dan? is presently the Vice President of Prevention in the U.S. for Epic Risk Management um, and had previously served as the Assistant Executive Director for the Council on Compulsive Gambling of New Jersey, better known as 800 Gambler. Upon graduating from the College of New Jersey with a major in finance and concentration in economics, he spent 12 years in the world of investment banking, risk management, and financial planning. Despite the successful career, Dan has, had also been suffering in silence with a gambling disorder since high school. Having lived experience in the area of gambling addiction, coupled with the traumatic events of September 11th, 2001, Dan eventually left the world of finance so he could, he finance so he could heal personally and be a help to others who, uh, who suffer from or at risk to develop gambling problems. Dan has worked with stakeholders in over 25 states and has delivered hundreds of workshops, trainings, and keynote presentations around the country centered on prevention, education, and emerging trends in the world of gaming and gambling. Dan is also a co-host on the podcast Hello Craig with Craig Carton. Each week, Craig and Dan speak to a person in recovery. The show's hope is that by sharing gambling recovery stories, more people will learn about this addiction and minimize the stigma associated with it. Now, they do not have really formal presentations. This is going to be a dialogue between the two of them. And given that format, please, anytime you have a question or a thought or whatever, just catch our attention and uh, we will uh, have you join the conversation. And uh, with that, his attention because he'll have the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So you can keep that one. Hi, Dan. <laughs> okay, so right, Chris. It's good. I'm looking in your eyes. Are you looking in my? I mean, do I look weird to you, or or is this? You, is, look, uh, you look small. I can squish you right here, just like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one of the few times I've been called small, but okay, I'll take. It. <laughs> so um, there's all kinds of things that that we'd like to cover uh, today, and as just to reiterate, if you do have a question you know, at any point, please, please ask it. But I thought, Dan, uh, just uh, to start off, it was in the introduction mentioned, you know, 12 years in investment banking, uh, <clears throat> risk management, financial planning. So tell us a little about your story. I mean, your background, and then, you know, as you, you know, and then dealing with gambling. Sure. Thank you. And, and it's great to be here with you today, Chris. It's, it's an honor and it's great to be back um, to speak at the closing session today for the Minnesota conference. So thank you, Susan, and to the others who made this uh, possible. You know, I, I, I did a session earlier today and I kind of went through my journey and my story a bit. You know, I grew up uh, in a house, you know, my father worked at Merck Pharmaceuticals. My father was in business. My brother was an accountant. So business and finance seemed to be in our blood growing up. But I was always told that, you know, accounting's boring, finance is fun. So I went the finance route. And along with finance came the world of investing. And, you know, I, I grew up uh, in a house. My mom had left early on. So it was my brother, my father, and myself. And we would talk about, you know, gambling a lot. And there was a lot of alcohol flowing and uh, the stock market, the stock pages, you know, always researching something. I, I got involved in investing at a really early age. And it was it's funny because when I look back and I think about picking a stock or picking a mutual fund at the time, 
I also loved handicapping horses and horse racing. And I'm sure we'll talk about today some of those similarities, but it kind of really started early on the romancing of kind of the, the process of investing and handicapping and trying to figure out what to do. And right. I, just love, that, I love that, that world. That ability to do that math and that, which is essentially finance, right? hundred percent. It's, yeah. It's it's romancing the process, Chris. It, it's like there's something about I want to find that added edge. And especially as a young person, I'm like, well, this is great. Fuels my ego, too. And if I can make a little money, it's a win win. Yeah. So, so one of the things about now, we just think about where we are today. And so you're on Wall Street and yeah. you're, you're on the trading floor. You know what is what, what they're like, although it used to be the trading floor and probably when you were there. There are a lot of people screaming and yelling at each other. Now it's a lot of computers. Yeah. Uh, it's much quieter when, when you're on the trading floor on Wall Street. But you know, you're mentioned, you know, you're young, it's fun, you're handicapped horses. Now we got this thing called Robin Hood. Yeah. And, and, you know, if you were now that same person, you know, a young person right now, you'd be thinking about Robin Hood and the yeah. gamification of you know, investing on Wall Street. And don't you think that's kind of, you know, it's actually probably even less complicated than what you were doing trying to handicap horses. That's not easy to do. You yeah. know, you can go on Robin Hood and it's pretty easy to say what's the what's the latest meme stock. Right. And, you know, it, it, it's it's so accessible now. And that's the big difference. You know, fast forward from when I was there back 98 to 03, and then as a financial planner at Prudential until 10, you know, to where we are today with technology, with available information. And you can go on any social media page, you can go on online, and you'll find the person who's got the next 10 best stock picks, the five best meme stocks, the next Bitcoin craze, whatever it is, there's always someone trying to predict it and it's right at our fingertips. It's so easy. And that becomes part of the problem, Chris. It's so accessible that Robinhood has now opened up the ability for the everyday individual investor to buy fractional shares, to invest in one hundredth of a Berkshire Hathaway, class A, to invest in the smallest fractional investment you can have, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It's good to have people investing and saving for their futures. I'm sure you would agree. But when you look at the gamification, you use that word so well, it is. It looks like and feels like a game. And I think we have that concern about the, the instant gratification. That's the phrase I want to throw out there. Okay. You know, we don't have that buy and hold long term Peter Lynch model. Everything is about get rich quick. I want it now. Flip the trade and move on to something else. And it's also one of the questions I wanted to ask you. And when I was thinking about this conversation, you're in risk management. And so what does risk management really mean? Because if you think about, if, if I'm talking to somebody and they're playing, uh, you know, they're playing the stock market, they're trying to do day trading, whatever it is they're trying to do, that's going to be quick. Yeah. Talking about risk management. They're talking yeah. about risk, right? That, and it's a broad There's term, a, right? Those are two different things. Yeah. It's a broad term, risk management, you know, managing those everyday risks. And in the world of investments, there's different types of risk an individual must understand. And a lot of people don't understand them. I like to break it down very simply. You know, there's appropriate risks and there's inappropriate risks. And we we see those all the time, but, but people might not understand what's appropriate or inappropriate if they don't have the knowledge and the experience and the understanding about what they're getting involved with. When you have a market and you own a portfolio of stocks or you're running a hedge fund, there's all types of risks associated with that, right? Financial risk, business risk, the risk of the market. You know, today the market was up. But, you know, when you have inflation concerns, then the market goes down. We have interest rate risk, purchasing power, specific risks, specific to an industry. So there's all types of risk, ma that risk management that needs to happen to mitigate or to kind of hedge to the best of one's ability any non-necessary or you know, mitigatable risks. So we just don't see proper risk management from the everyday investor. They don't hedge. They're not institutions. They're not large scale um, brokerage houses. So they get caught not following the market for a second. And all of a sudden they can, you could be wiping out hundreds or thousands of dollars. You know, Warren Buffett once said the market can go from, from what was it, green to red, 
without missing a beat, right? I mean, you can just lose everything so quickly without even knowing what the heck just happened. So run an idea for you. So one of the things that, that I like, you know, in thinking about personal finance is forget everything about the market. Just what you're <laughs> talking about, right? Just put that aside. Put your feet up on a table. Don't have any, you know, don't have any uh, mutual funds. No, don't, nothing. Turn off the computer and think about what is it you want your money to support? Yeah. What is the life that you want to lead? And then think about, okay, so... I want to save for retirement. I want to save for my kids' college education. Uh, I like to buy a home. You know, you think about I like to have a sense of stability in my life, or I like to be able to provide a certain environment for my family. And that actually then personal finance becomes okay. How do I tap into my resources, whatever income you have coming in or whatever, to support that? And yet it's really easy for personal finance to become, how can I beat the market? Or how can I find this stock, right? Yes. And so, I mean, what do you think of this idea? You know, at first you just take all that, all that information and put it aside and do some introspection, do some conversation with your family, do some conversations with your friends. It's, it's logic and reason versus emotion, right? And that's what we're starting to see, a lot of emotion, emotional investing, emotional decision-making, it's great to have a sound plan in place, but when you have a friend or a buddy or coworker telling you that they just made a quick five thousand or five hundred dollars on the latest fad and craze, there's going to be a part of human beings that say, "Oh, how could I have missed that? What was I thinking?" It's hard to stick to a plan when you see the other end happening, which is the get rich quick, instant right. gratification. And I agree with you. And that's unfortunately what we see in the world of not just day trading and investing, but we're also seeing it kind of hedge over with the gambling side as well. Because you'll see people with, from a gambling perspective will say, okay, I'm not going to bet just on, on one game. I'm not going to worry about my money management. I'm going to put it all on this game because everyone loves, last night, everyone loves the Philadelphia Eagles to beat the Washington Redskins. And when the Redskins beat them outright, that upset a lot of people. And a lot of betters took a beating on that game last night. Right. So you see the same thing happen in the market. And, and so it is, you throw out the, the rational thinking, you throw it out the window and emotion starts to run and that becomes problematic for people. And one of the things I found disturbing, so, you know, done a couple of call-in shows, we're talking about crypto, right? Uh, the cryptocurrencies. And one of the things that had really struck me was, well, the stock market's rigged. The bond market's rigged. The financial system's rigged. And so this lack of trust in these sort of like, you know, basic, the housing market is rigged. doesn't matter what you're talking about. It's all rigged. So therefore, I'm just going to gamble. I'm going to bet on cryptocurrency. Yes. Because, now this is the part that always got to me, dot, 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 because it's not rigged. <laughs> yeah. But it's a gambling market. <laughs> and then we see what happened to FTX just a couple of days ago in news. Exactly. And now cryptocurrency is rigged. There's no regulation. And I have a problem with, with, with do, investing in something where there's a lack of regulatory oversight, where it's not backed by the full faith and credit of a particular of, of a government agency. You yeah. know, we, we saw this in the past, and I'll take it back to the gaming and gambling space. When you had the, the fantasy sports contests and daily fantasy sports about five to seven years ago were really blowing up. DraftKings, FanDuel operators were just promoting and marketing the heck out of this stuff. And money was being made hand over fist, but there was zero regulation, zero enforcement, marketing out the wazoo. And all of a sudden, the, the government kind of stepped in and said, hold on a second here. Let's start slowing this thing down. We've got advertisements every eight seconds on the airwaves in some markets, and, and they're making a lot of money and with very little oversight or regulatory risk. Industry doesn't stay around very long when they start making hundreds of millions of dollars with very little regulation. Yeah. So- Oh, we have a question here. Hi, Dan. It's Susan. Hey, Susan. <laughs> so I wanted to you you just touched upon it, but the what concerns me, particularly with younger people who are attracted to uh, Robin Hood and and those kind of spaces and cryptocurrency, is the amount of advertising and the messaging that they're receiving. Because I mean, we had the likes of Matt Damon standing up and saying, you know, I, I forget what the term he used, but 
but basically, um, you know, you're a wimp if you um, if you don't um, invest in crypto. And you know, how do we combat that kind of onslaught of messaging um, in the prevention work that we're doing? So, can we just jump in for a moment here, Dan? And then go ahead. You know, a big part of it is until right now is the message when you're seeing in the spring you saw a collapse in the crypto market now with ftx you're seeing another collapse in the crypto market um you're actually seeing really plunges in prices so when something is going up and people can always think that it's going to go up those messages are really hard but now there's actually a reality here and a lot of people who thought that they were ahead are now suddenly finding themselves that they were behind. So I think now there's more credibility to that statement than there was um, six months ago. Dan? Yeah, and and that I agree. Uh, you know, it's hard to have a conversation about, hey, diversify, be smart, don't put all your eggs in one basket, hedge, save for a rainy day. You know, I, I just had this conversation with my 17-year-old son, so this is perfect timing. My stepfather's been retired um, with a with a fairly good nest egg for for a number of years. Loves to invest. Buy some of the newsletters. You know, Louis Navalier is one of the guys that he loves to follow. Chris, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Lou Navalier. Yeah. Sure. Um, and you know, so he looks at it, reads his newsletter, and a lot of it is you do a little bit at a time. You dollar cost average. That makes sense. But he'll sit there and tell my 17 year old son, "Hey, get in the market." And that's what I did when I was 16, 17. I had a custodial account. I started investing. So he's following my footsteps there. But my son is always like, "Listen, you know, stock. Uh, you know, the, the newsletter says this is going to happen. You know, pop up thinks it's going to continue to go up. Okay, things don't go up forever. We know that with the housing market. We know that with the technology stocks. But it's all looking backwards through history. So history has to be our guide." But the events have to take place first in order for history to be our guide. So it is extremely hard to have that conversation with someone when they're making money. But lately, my son, and all he wants to talk about is, hey, how do I prevent myself from losing more money? <laughs> exactly. And I don't know if your stepfather does this, but you know, the other thing is, look, there's nothing wrong with matching your wits in the market. There's nothing wrong with, hey, there's this new thing called cryptocurrency. I've read about it. Okay, I'm going to put some money into it. I'm going to learn how this works, or at least I'm going to think I'm going to learn how it works. Right. It's like it's almost like you're taking your entertainment money. And you know, rather than spending it on cable, you're spending it in the market. And if you lose, okay, you lose. If you win, hey, that's kind of cool. That's kind of fun. Like, you know, like with your son. But Really, what you're what you're doing is it, it's saying I want to have a little bit of fun, but I'm not putting anything fundamental at risk. I'm not putting my home at risk. I'm not putting my retirement at risk. I'm not putting my child's college education at risk. In which case, you know, people have tried to match their wits in the markets in all different kinds of ways. You know, for millennium. Yes. And so it's like there's nothing wrong with that activity. The only concern becomes when that be, when that sidelight or that side hustle or that here I'm going to have some fun and because I think I can I think that I know what's the next biotechnology stock that is going to you know get the vaccine and the market's going to recognize have that fun to saying well that's what it's all about. And, and, and that's the message I think you can get across. Yeah. And, th and that's a concern, right? Because what we start to see, and this is a great conversation. You know, I had a phone call from a, a, a gentleman in recovery from gambling addiction for 12 years. He reached out to me and he said, listen, I, I want to run something past you. I've got the inside information. So there's a buzzword right there that we don't want to hear in any in sport in gambling or in the stock market. I got inside information on this new company that's producing mushrooms to help with uh, medical conditions. And he goes, I think it's going to be a really good one. I want to invest money in it. And I said, hold on a second here. Hmm. He said, you're a person in recovery from a gambling addiction and you're talking. Now, I'm not saying not to do it. Everyone needs to, to make their own decision. But what I said was, be careful. Be careful that you're, you know, make sure you're doing the research, that you're doing it for the right reasons. Because if you're in recovery from a gambling problem and you're starting to take flyers and 
you know, Chris, you just said something really important. We have to make sure that we we separate almost the investment piece from the entertainment piece. I think that's critical. Too many people are saying, oh, yeah, I'm investing in cryptocurrency. Okay, that's an interesting perspective. But if you lose that money or 50 percent of that value tomorrow, was that entertainment? Are you going to chase that? Is it still investing? Are you going to bail out? Right. We have to properly categorize these investments. You know, there was a research study recently done out of Australia that talked about cryptocurrency trading and the connection with gambling and mental health. And it's been there are connections in Australia that they're researching now connecting these between anxiety, depression and young men. And that's what they're starting to see this concern about those who partake in crypto trading um, also tend to be the ones that have exhibited problematic gambling behaviors, as well as mental health issues like anxiety and depression. Yeah, and there's another one I was looking at. It's coming. It came out of Japan where they looked at financial literacy, financial education, and gambling, and they didn't find any real. You know, and this is an academic study, and you have your database, so all those limitations. They didn't find that ha- financial education had a big impact, but financial literacy did, mm. and um, you know, which kind of reinforces you know what, what you're saying is just the financial literacy. One of the things what financial literacy does is gets back to the beginning of our conversation. It's really a way to think about, it helps you think through your financial risks, through your financial trade-offs. And that's really what financial literacy is. It doesn't tell you what to do or this is the right thing to do, but it does get you thinking about the trade-offs and being more realistic about, in this difference, I like this, between investing and entertainment. Yeah, and that's a that's an important point to make. I think, you know, when we go back and think about Robinhood and we think about the the younger investor, and I, I can't help but make some of the connections between people who are trading rapidly on a Robinhood or even day trading on an app versus those who are also gambling on sports. Because in certain jurisdictions, you have what's called in-play sports betting, which means that you can just bet the next pitch of a baseball game. You can bet the next sequence of plays in a football game. And I think about the basic premise of immediate gratification versus delay of gratification. And in, it's just fascinating when you look at the similarities between the, the blinking lights, the flashing lights, the sounds, the engagement, right? You're immersed in this world in both cases where you're just so separated from reality and you're in front of your digital screen, both can become and start to exhibit problematic behaviors by chasing a feeling or looking for the next best thing. Um, there, there's a lot of overlap between those two activities. So I'm curious in, in your conversation with people, what is work? So if I'm talking about personal finance, personal finance really is nothing more than a couple of good habits. And mm-hmm. because of technology, we kind of can tap technology to help us make some good habits. So if you have a 401k, a 403b at work, the money automatically comes out, out of your paycheck. You know, it just, you actually never, it never even shows up in your checking account. It just happens every biweekly or a month, whatever, whatever your pay schedule is. And you can go on to your bank or your credit union and you can say, put $15 a month into my savings account. And you can do that. So you're automating because how many of us, if we actually had to every month remember, oh, I got to put some money in that retirement savings plan, or I got to put some, yeah, how often are we going to do it? But, and then you want to say, you know, okay, so, and then what really matters is, look, just buy a broad-based uh, index fund, low fee, you'll always do as well as the market. It's good stuff. It's really boring. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it just is. So. Yeah. What are you, what do you find that there are certain ways about framing that that resonate with people? You know, I think it depends on the on the circumstance. I can equate it. I can equate that to kind of having that responsible gambling philosophy. It's not fun to be consistent at times. <laughs> And that's how I'm going to say it. And I, re- I remember that from when I was a financial planner. I had a system and a method. I shouldn't say a system. That sounds bad, especially because I ended up embezzling over $2 million to fuel my gambling addiction. So when I say a system, that, that sounds Bertie Madoffish. Uh, so I <laughs> want to say I had a, a good strategy whereby I knew that if I made 100 phone calls every Tuesday night, which was our call night, if I made 100 phone calls, I would talk to 20 people and I would secure eight appointments. 
And if I secured eight appointments in a given week, that would lead to two to three sales, which means I would hit my, hit my sales targets every week. And okay. that worked like clockwork, week in and week out. And six months into that, I would deviate from the plan. I don't know why. It was boring. It was, cal- it was, it was calculated. It was almost predictable, like clockwork. Yet human nature, I was getting bored. I right. wanted it's something a little bit. And it's the ego. I thought I could do it better if I did it a little differently. And I think that's what we start to see is if we go back to human nature, we start to get a play on personality traits. You get a play on the ego. You get a play on emotional decision making. And what fuels a lot of that is the marketing, the peer to peer conversation you have, the social media. So it's external influences. Your environment influences that. And then you start to deviate away from the little things that make you successful in recovery. The same thing will happen when someone goes back and starts drinking again or gambling again. That's not, it didn't happen the day they placed the bet or drank that drink. It happened months ago when they stopped doing the little things that made them successful in their recovery. So it's this play on human nature is what it seems like. And so part of this play on human nature. So it seems to me that there is all this marketing, right? And there is all this temptation. And, it, you know, it, and these are really sophisticated people who are designing uh, the systems, designing the gamification of trading, you know, going, whatever you're doing. But it seems that one of the things that you can, you can do to counteract that is to, you know, create your own financial circle where you re- I was it, talking to uh, some people living on low and unstable incomes. And they got together once a month at a restaurant. And this is pre-COVID, so they could actually, you know, now we can go back to restaurants. But they were going to the <laughs> restaurant. And um, they would decide, okay, they all decided to get out of uh, car debt. And one of them had gotten out of car debt. I think it was like eight people, eight, 10 people. One had gotten out of car debt. She explained how she did it. It was all women. And uh, so the other ones came up with their system. But the thing that really worked is that when they got together, they'd always say, how are you doing? And you'd have a conversation and maybe you, you, you shade things a little bit, but not too much. And um, and then they would go on. And then they what was really striking is a bunch of them wanted to start their own business. Mm. They reinforce each other that way. So I think in our society, one of the most powerful ways to turn what is essentially, you know, to bring this certainty, this consistency to your personal finances, and we have this desire to break it up, is actually to tap into some people you know who are sharing your similar interests, have similar goals, and work with each other to be accountable. Accountability is huge. And, and that's the concept of peer-to-peer support in a way. If you, yeah. if, if, you know, Chris, you and I, we can be friends, but we might uh, and, and, have, and have a great time hanging out and we could have a lot of things that we agree on in life and we seek support in many different ways from each other. Uh, we lean on each other. But when it comes to finances, we might just be at totally different ends of the spectrum. You know, you're based on where you are in your life, based on where I am in my life, it just doesn't line up. And I think what we try to, what we tend to do in life is we tend to find those people that we naturally gravitate towards. And we then try to apply all of our situations to be aligned with theirs. When the fact of the matter is you end up keeping up with the Joneses half the time or you'll die trying. And it's a financial death. It's taking out extra credit cards and putting stuff and I'll just pay it later when I get that job raise that I was promised, which then never comes no, because fact, the economic up. downturn. So- it's about aligning yourself with the right people in the right space. And it's okay to have different sections of friends and support. You're right. I agree with you. But peer support leads to accountability, no doubt. Yeah. And so, and what do you think of this idea that really personal finance is, is a bunch of habits? It's just, I mean, we, you know, and I love, I love economics. I love finance. I love reading the Wall Street Journal. I talk about what might happen to the economy. I mean, uh, and I love doing that. And it's really intriguing. And I get a lot of pleasure out of it. And I study it. And I talk about it. But really, if you just get down to managing your money, which is our topic for for this hour, it's just a bunch of good. It's just several habits. 
Yes, it's a lot of good habits. Um, but, but there's a phrase that I use a lot, and I think it applies to many different areas of life. I'm going to throw this out there for you. The phrase is rules without relationships leads to rebellion. And if I don't, if I only follow the rules, right, these hard and fast rules without developing a real deeper relationship or understanding as to why I'm doing it and to why it matters, yeah, I'm going matters. to rebel. And I see it time and time again across so many different walks of life. Personal finance, budgeting is certainly one of them. Rules without relationships leads to rebellion. What do you think about that phrase? I think it's really important because that gets to why are you doing this? Yeah. And what is the point of doing this? Like, you know, budgeting, the B word. Yeah. No one likes budgeting. Now, the reality is if you do a budget, you don't have to do it for very long. I mean, the information, you can get the information over a couple of months and then, but, and it's really, really valuable information. But again, if you're just budgeting and then because you've been told to budget and then you kind of like move things around a little bit, I mean, you know, you don't get anything out of that. Right. The you, reason you, why you want to go budgeting is you got a goal, you got a reason exactly. and you need to find some money and then you stop budgeting because if you found the money and you solved your problem, life goes on. Cause we, we most of us are pretty good at having a mental budget what's coming in, what's going out. But I think I think you're absolutely right. It's all about, this is one of those times, it's not quite right to say it's all about me because it can be about your family or yeah. it can be about your household. But it really is about what matters to us. And then 100%. you things like budgeting. 100%, you just hit it on the head. You know, when we used to, when I was in a sales role, we'd always... We, you, you can try to go into a house or talk to a business owner, or even today with Epic, when we work with partners and stakeholders around the country, you can go in and try to sell a product. You know, okay, you have a need, you know, here's the product. This is what will solve the issue. But are you really tapping into the underlying issue? And are you really fully understanding the need and the relationship with that need? You know, what keeps you up at night? What is the thing that you're trying to protect against? What are you trying to achieve in the future? How can we get you to achieve those goals. Because once the individual states, you know, life insurance is always one of those classic examples. After September 11th happened, life insurance sales in the United States for those several years after skyrocketed right. because people were afraid and they wanted to protect their family and wanted to make sure that if something, God forbid, happened, especially working in a large city, that their family would be protect protected. But over time, you know, hu human nature, that kind of went out of the news or as the years went on. And the sales started dropping back down towards, you know, prehistoric levels, if you will. But during that time, that emotional connection was so high. And that's what you have to really, for personal financial planning, you have to understand, why am I doing what I'm doing? What's the importance to me, my family? What goal am I trying to achieve? And then I make the connection with, in a way, the world of, of, of gambling and those other things, what's going to interfere with me achieving my goal? And one area we're starting to see as a concern, Chris, is the world of gambling and sports betting because in some instances, you can put credit cards on file, you can gamble online and put it on credit. Now that's not a good idea. No, no, it's a terrible idea. And it's become, again, it's become so easy. It's so ubiquitous. You watch the ads on TV and, uh, you know, a little sports betting, that's okay, right? But it just, I find it very disturbing. I find those ads very disturbing. They I really are. Huh? They really are. They only they, show yeah. the positive. Yeah. Just I mean, the positive side. Yeah, there's 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 nothing good that comes out of that, as far as I can tell. I saw one ad. It was um, I can't remember which state I was in, but it was the you know a team. They said, uh, you know, I'll just use an example. You know, you open up an account, and if if Tom Brady throws for more than one yard, then you're going to win two hundred and fifty dollars. Now, come on, that's not a bet. That's a <laughs> you're getting a free a free gift there. But the problem is, is now you're 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 kind of hooked in, right? And you have this thing that's really interesting. And now I've got this free two hundred and fifty dollars that I can play with. And and you know, I'll, can I give you an example? When yeah. I was when I was gambling, the I often get asked what was my largest win and my largest loss whenever I'm traveling the country speaking to college student athletes. They like to hear what's the most you ever won. And then I started saying, well, I'm going to tell you about the most I ever lost because I'm not going to glamorize the win. I don't want to feed into the narrative. 
And so I remember in, in January of 2008, it was my birthday, January 24th of 2008, the website I was gambling on gave me a $500 free play, free play. I had lost tens of thousands. So they gave me 500 back because I was a good customer. And so I took the $500, I turned it into $52,000 in six hours. And the rest of the day, I played through that 52,000. I ended up losing all of that money. The last of which came on a $25,000 hockey bet that night that the game lost one nothing. And I went to bed that night saying to myself in my head, that was not such a bad day after all, because it was zero out of pocket for me. They gave me the $500 for free. But the problem was I normalized the spending and the action and the repetitiveness of that day. I never gambled. I, I gambled at a totally different level after that. And that's the concern when we talk about speed, repetition, marketing, only seeing one side of the coin is that you're going to develop a distorted view of what reality is. And, and that's not good, especially for young, impressionable adults. And when you're talking to young athletes with this story, what do they say to you? Their jaws hit the floor because what I think what it drives, it drives home for them that, you know, fast money spends fast. Yeah. You can lose it just as fast as you make it. And you get a taste of what it feels like to have won. Just like if you hit a, a really good, well-timed day trade and you net a profit and it was quick. And all of a sudden in your mind, there's a part of you that says, why do I have to work today? I'm just going to sit behind my computer and laptop. I'm just going to trade. Why? You know, this is easy. I get to drink coffee, have breakfast. And I get to sit behind my laptop because it's socially acceptable. You know, I don't think we talk about that enough either. The view of the, the social cultural acceptance of being a successful investor versus being a successful gambler. There's a difference. And, and a lot of these successful investors are about as good as a successful person that goes fishing. Yeah. <laughs> you got a big fish, right? I mean, because I, I, I had a colleague and, and he was over the course of a year and it always struck me because I was young. I was just starting out and he played daily the stock options. So this was before uh, day trading, but she was back in the early eighties and he, he was up like a hundred, 120,000. And at the end of the year, he had zero. And he actually did walk away from it because he realized that all every day he was playing and he really thought he was smart and he was a very smart guy. But it turns out he wasn't that smart and he lost everything. Luckily, because it was options, he pretty much, you know, he lost a little bit more than than what he put in, but but not that much. And that is just always that stuck with me. And there's so many studies out there that just say the same thing. Right. I mean, they've this is what academics do. They've looked at the day traders. Nobody makes money over any period of time. I mean, the other thing is. Like you said, you know. You had the one, you know, where you made the most here, you made the loss. Everybody can make money one time, two times. But the question is consistency. Yeah. What all the academic studies show is you don't do it consistently, right? 100%. 100%. Yeah. The, the, the only way to do it consistently, as we know, is the boring way that we talked about, slow and steady. You know, yeah. long term, slow and steady, buy and hold, the market will generally outperform or generally. Re what was the statistic, Chris? I think it's what on average uh, your money doubles every 10 years. That's the rule of 72. 72. And, you know, so if you're if you're doubling every 10, 12 years, your money on a slow, consistent basis, that should be enough for people. But marketing and social media is designed to tap into our inner desires, those emotional impulsive reactive moves and it works you know it's there's a lot of psychology that goes into that and it taps into us and so it's this this constant war that's being waged internally that we struggle with and and we're all susceptible to it some more so than others and yeah. and that's the piece that's concerning is that the ones that tend to be more susceptible if we think about human brain development we know that the brain finishes developing mid to late 20s, assuming no other neurological disruption or delay. And it's the decision making, the risk taking piece that develops last. And so we've got young adults, emerging adults, college kids, high school kids, 
middle schoolers that need to have good financial literacy early on. So it's good habits forming at an early age. And so one of the things, uh, do you know, oh, uh, I got a question. Oh, yeah, thank you. I'll hold my thought. <laughs> Thanks, Don. Hey, Dan, it's Robbie. Yeah. Robbie Fuqua from LifeWorks. How are you? Hey, I'm doing well, Rob. Thanks for being here. Good, good to see you. And I'm sure you were happy with last night's win being a Giants fan, but that's not what my question is here. Absolutely. <laughs> and I love seeing the Minnesota beat Buffalo, too, for, for the Minnesota fans. I'll throw it right back at game, you. Man. Epic game. But all that scares me being a Cowboys fan. <laughs> so, uh, I'll move my question here. So it's great to hear both you guys speak today. And uh, I've got a, um, a, a case of a, a young college athlete uh, in my practice. And um, – uh, it, it's sports gambling, it's online gambling, and um, he's got a fascination about money, of course, and uh, had a family meeting, maybe it was last month, and dad brought up, well, listen, I'm, my plan, Robbie, is to just teach him some healthy financial principles, right, in the stock market. It's talking about, you know, Robin Hood and some other things. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, you know, I gave him some psychoeducation right off the bat that that's, that's gambling, basically. And I positioned it to a point like, I understand you're trying here. But he's 18 years old. His frontal lobe is still developing. He's, a, he's on his way to college next year on a D1 scholarship. So we're kind of in a holding pattern here, to be yeah. honest with you. Yeah, And I'm seeing how this is turning out. I'm trying to help them to see money through a healthy lens at this point. Yeah. And one of the things I, I tell him, and even my young male, uh, you know, cases that I have is what do you want to be in 10 years? Just not financially and otherwise, but I've asked this young man that, where do you want to be here? Of course, he wants to be a pro ball player and he might be, who knows? Yeah. Um, Out of his gambling on sports. <laughs> that was my next. Exactly. And he knows that, too. You know, um, so we're saying that what just from your experience in all these areas, what's your viewpoint on dad's position here? And again, dad's trying. I told him that this is gambling, too, as well. And his heart about dropped. But I mean, what do you think about that? Because, you know, with this, and I'm sorry, I'll stop talking after this. It's it's a process addiction, right? I mean, yeah. risk, money, um, he wants to go into business. How can he do this in a healthy way moving forward? What's what, what's his major going to look like in college with baseball? He You know, he wants to go into business. But all this can be, you know, triggering for him. But uh, sure. anyways, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, great, great. And thank you for so much for sharing that. And, and you know, obviously, as always, feel free to reach out, you know, separately offline, use me as a resource, because I too, I was a baseball player, as I think, you know, you know, the whole world of finance and business, happy to be a resource if I can help. Um, you know, I think I always want to understand what people, you know, what do they expect? What's their view of money? What does money mean to them? Because you've already indicated he has a background of, of betting. And, and he'll, I've got to be very clear here. You know, we have a contract with the NCAA. If you're an student athlete coming to college to play sports, um, and if you're found betting on sports, he will be terminated really quick. Now, if he has an ongoing addiction problem, there's some wiggle room where they'll work with him if he's getting the help he needs. But he's opening himself up to not starting off really positively his freshman year. But the gambler's view of money is something I often talk about, even for young adults and for teenagers. If you're a person who likes to gamble, the way you view money – is different than how a non-gambler or a non-risk taker will view money. You know, traditionally money is viewed as a source of security or status or just a simple medium of exchange um, used to accomplish goals, if you will. But to the person who likes to take risk and he's a competitive D1 athlete, right? So he's, he's competitive, he's a risk taker and he has a fear of failure. So there's something that's motivating him. And it's something that's fear-based, it seems. So getting to what his fears are is also another good path to kind of go down, you know, because you might find there's this sense of he's always wanted to be secure. He uses money that way. But money allows a gambler to stay in action. He's losing the value of a dollar. Does he play video games? And if he does, does he spend money on those games? Because that distorts the view of a dollar also. When you have a million dollars in Grand Theft Auto, that's not a million dollars. It's just play money. But all of a sudden, it distorts the view of people. So 
I would kind of steer towards the Robin Hood not being gambling because operationally and technically it's not, but similar to gambling and can elicit the same type of gambling behaviors and responses and draw those parallels, you know, draw those similarities between the two in terms of the research, if he's a sports better, that's why he's trying to do something that's more socially acceptable. And, you know, we don't know what his, I don't know what his culture or his personal values are, but those are the things that influence our financial decisions. And, and, you know, Chris, I'll, I'll kind of look to you on this because some people, you know, there was something I read one time and the question was what influences your money story? Where do you get your attitudes about money from? Where do you get your financial habits from? It's usually emotional, cultural, and personal. And so kind of go down those pathways to see how he adopted and, and, and kind of received these views. Those would be some of the recommendations that I would suggest. You know, off of what you're just saying, so I had a podcast and um, called Small Change, uh, Money Stories from the Neighborhood. So go into a uh, neighborhood, people living on low and unstable incomes. And we interviewed somebody from the neighborhood who had figured it out. Low, unstable income, but how to buy a house, how to start a business. And, you know, you start off an interview and ask one of the, you know, one of the first questions would be, where where, where did you learn about money? Uh, did you learn from your parents? No, didn't learn anything from my parents. Never, nope, nope, nope. Half an hour later, 45 minutes later, they start talking about how they'd observed their parents. And it turned out everybody had just learned an enormous amount from their parents in their neighborhood observing them. But their initial response always was, no, I didn't, I didn't learn anything. No, my parents never talked about money, but they'd notice about the, the dad who had the, uh, who worked as a janitor, but then in the weekends was a landscaper. And the mom who was a stay at home mom, but every night when the kids went to bed, she had a sewing business, you know, that kind of a story. And they learned about money that way. Yeah. And so I do think it's really interesting that question about where did you learn about money? And usually people don't initially, initially almost like reject that question hmm. because they think, well, we never talked about that. They have this image that you're having a formal conversation around the dinner table about taxes and the IRS and income. And it's not that it's how you observe what people are doing. And we got another question. Is yeah, we do uh, from one of, uh, from JJ who is uh, joining us remotely. Uh, I said, are you saying that relapse is a process that reaches a peak at the time of use or engaging in previous beha gambling behavior? Is it abstinence that equates recovery? Just re read the question back again. I want to digest the question. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and to me, the, the, the key is that last is that was that last part of it. Is it, it does abstinence equate recovery? But beyond that, he says, is relapse a process that reaches a peak at the time of reaches the time of use? Uh, or uh, I think this goes back to when you, you were talking about how the seeds of relapse were actually planted months before the relapse actually happened. Yeah, that's what I was kind of gathering as well. And I want to just to give that a thought for a moment. Um, I've always thought of the concept that, you know, early on in my addiction recovery, I've been in recovery 12 and a half years, February 11, 2010 was my last bet. Early on in my process of no longer gambling, I wasn't working on me. I was, I was abstaining from the pure fact that I just knew that I can't gamble today. I didn't know why. I just knew, well, I didn't know why. I didn't want to go back to prison. I didn't want to have bigger charges brought against me, but it wasn't for the right reasons. I was following the rule of do not gamble. And over time, abstinence is very critical early on, but as you start to get involved in maybe a program, whatever works for you on, on your journey, because everyone finds a different path towards recovery. It's whatever works for them. It's individualized. For me, it was a, a combination of a faith-based fellowship as well as Gamblers Anonymous. That's what worked for me. And as I moved along that path, I started to quickly realize I need to do need to do some work on myself. So while I'm no longer gambling, I'm still abstaining, but I'm also now in a recovery mode of saying, let me recover to the person who I've always been. You know, I'm a human being and I drifted away from a lot of healthy habits and behaviors in my life to fill that need that I felt that I had to gamble to feel a certain way. But as I started working on the emotional disconnect that September 11th left 
um, that my mom leaving when I was two, I never worked or processed those things. But when I started doing the hard work, the inventory, taking a, a, a toll of myself to a checklist, then I started saying, wow, you know, this recovery is me about creating a new life where the gambling no longer fits in. It's not just abstaining anymore. It's about creating a new life where the gambling no longer fits in. But if I were to ever start so to, to stop doing those things, now I'm starting to let the gambling back into my life to fill a void. I have to be really careful with that. So I, I don't think it's only about the abstinence. And I want to make sure I'm answering the question. I think that if we go back towards abstinence and we move away from a healthy recovery, we're starting to go back one step closer to gambling again. And that's where those seeds, that's what I talk about. Make sure you're doing the daily things, the little things that make us successful on a daily basis, because left unchecked without accountability, without peer support, we can start not achieving our goal, if you were, to bring this conversation full circle. And that's why we need relationships in our life. We can't just do it by following rules alone or else we're at risk of rebelling. Hopefully that answered the question. When, uh, when you said that, it, it struck me good to go, but it went back to something, something that you said earlier, which is um, the importance of understanding the why of the rules. And I think very often we treat abstinence as an end where it's actually a means. Mm. Fair? We got a question back there. Uh, just more of a comment. Com or a comment. Yeah, I think, you know, in relating to that abstinence and, you know, ongoing and going back in a relapse, I think sometimes we fail to look at recovery as a total lifestyle change, mm. you know, that embodies our spirit, our mind, and our body. And oftentimes I see people just focusing on, okay, just the alcohol, just the gambling, yeah, which is good for us for a period of time. But then like Dan was sharing, and it's I'm in recovery and it's like I couldn't do it for a period of time. But then I had to start working on other things to make the lifestyle change to the goals I wanted to have in my life. I think that's... That's that's a great point. And I, I you know what I agree with that because it comes around those the wholesale lifestyle changes, right? I, I was at a conference in uh Inner Harbor, National Harbor years ago for Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America. CADCA does a conference every year. And the speaker during the keynote was from the National Institute of Behavioral Health. And one of his phrases was by Dr. Robert DuPont. He said, the end goal of Treat, the end goal of treatment is a sustainable and meaningful long-term recovery. And I always think about the term sustainable and meaningful because that differs from person to person. And I agree, I can make some short-term changes that I can deal with for a little while, but until I transform, that's the big difference, a change versus a transformation. In, in, in my world, that's what's worked when I, when I kind of phrased it that way. And I had a desire to do things differently and create a new life where the gambling no longer fit in, a wholesale transformation, a whole new life. It is, it's a lifestyle approach. I agree with that. It, it lowers the risk of return to use or relapse. Well, I, you know, something that, again, that, that brings to my mind is given uh, you know, some of the linkages we've talked about between gambling behavior and uh, investment behavior, should, um, recovery counseling from gambling be, include uh, warning people in recovery about investment practices. 100%. Well, yes, 100%. A matter of fact, in the big book, in, in Gamblers Anonymous, they do talk very clearly about that. You know, there's sections of the book that say, you know, if you're in recovery from gambling, you also should not do X, Y, Z. And day trading is one of the items. Mm -hmm. Because when you look at the nature, sometimes it doesn't have to be operationally or technically defined as gambling for the, to elicit certain behaviors. 
Daily fantasy sports contests in many jurisdictions is not considered sports wagering, yet you're still risking something of value in order to try to win something of value where there's risk or uncertainty. So for some people in recovery, for many people in recovery, that can elicit those very similar type of gambling responses. So a lot of times it's more about the behaviors than it is about whether it's technically defined as gambling. And there's pressure relief. And that's the point I want to make in a GA room you will have what what differentiates Gamblers Anonymous from other fellowships is the focus on the financial piece because gambling addiction is an emotional disorder. It's a process addiction. It's not a money problem. Money problems result from somebody's gambling disorder, but it has to be addressed because that can be what leads a person back to gambling as well. So let me me turn back to another question about, we're talking about financial literacy. What are the simple sound bites that we need to communicate on financial literacy? Because it strikes me a lot of them, I think, of what we are trying to communicate on responsible gambling, they're, they're kind of the same thing. What are those sound bites and who should be communicating those? <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, the funny sound bite I think about is do the opposite of what culture tells you to do. <laughs> well, you know, it's don't look for the instant gratification. Don't don't buy now. Right. Save for later. Right. Don't worry about get rich quick. Slow and steady wins the race. It's the opposite of the message we get right now. You know, hurry up. You got eight hours left to get this hot flash deal. You won't need it. You're not going to need 18 pairs of tube socks a week from now. You're just not. (laughs) But there is I mean, you can sort of look if you're talking in Minnesota, you do. I'm not sure (laughs) to a young person. They're going to want to take risks. Yeah, they are. That is to be rewarded. I mean, that yeah. is to be applauded. We want young people, we want people throughout their life, but we want people to be taking risks. Appropriate risks, yes. Appropriate risks. So that's the whole thing. It's like this whole conversation is not about the market. It's not whether you should be investing in the market or not. Invest, you know, if you're a young person, you get a job with a company that has a 401k, 403b, participate in it. But it's talking to young people about what risks do you want to take? Yeah. What is the yeah. kind of life? Do you want to start your own business? Right. Do you want, you know, what, what what kind of life do you want to construct? What are the risks that are out there? And I think most young people are not going to come up with a story that they want to spend their time in the basement playing Robin Hood, right? I mean, yeah. but you have to, and there's too much about that financial literacy is about investment. Financial, it, you know, if you just put the money that you're making in a savings account, but it means you can tell your employer to go to hell and go to another employer if you're not happy, and you're a young person, that's freedom. Ah, right? So that's you a- want to talk about financial literacy, not in terms of, of abstinence or what you can't do, or it's about freedom and opportunity. And if you... And think it's about freedom, opportunity, and risk. And how do you create a life where those three things feed off each other? And then that is part of what financial literacy really is, I think. And it's asking, what does financial freedom mean to you? Because it's going to mean something different to each person, right? And you know, having that ability to tell the boss to F off and then go do your own thing because you have six months savings in the bank or a year. I, you know, I, and I agree, Every, Chris, everything you just said, I agree with. And, and it comes down to having simple understanding of how do you budget you know what's a need versus a want some of these basic things that we can start to instill and understanding what does financial freedom mean to you you know what what is important in your life and it'll change over time we know that but you want to build in flexibility the one thing i've learned in life is build in flexibility and as a gambler in recovery you know for years i haven't had that because of all the financial devastation that follows you but it's achievable and what is financial freedom? What is peace of mind? You know, what what allows you to sleep well at night? And it changes over time. Hey, Dan, it's Robbie one last time. Because hey, I'm not about to hear, but I, I, I really love what you guys talked about risk. And that's where I'm seeing it come down w- with me because I have other clients. I have one that's an actuary talking about managing risk, right? <laughs> Uh, a, a, you know, another one that day at day trades, you did a great talk for us for day trading. But uh, Chris, I really enjoyed what you said about managing risk, because that's where I see and that's where I'm learning in this work is where the process addiction is just not about 
money in someone's hands. It's about managing risk and what's appropriate, inappropriate, healthy versus unhealthy, and walking with them to see what can work out. And again, I try to get them to look 10 years from now in the future where they want to be. And those high risk behaviors, it's it's it 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 can be really triggering from whatever whatever it might be, if that makes mm. sense. Yeah. Great stuff. Robbie, always good to hear your thoughts and your comments. You do great work and so great that you're here today. We have about one minute left. You guys, I'd love, I, I could listen to you guys for a long time, but well, this is a bit of throw us out of here. So I just want, if you, um, any closing comments or thoughts? Uh, listen, I think we covered a lot today, Chris. And just like you and I kind of briefed a couple of weeks ago, we, we knew we'd be able to talk and, and bring this any, any number of ways. And I think we just, the, the way the flow of the conversation's really been, my biggest takeaway is what you just kind of talked about. Financial literacy is not about investing in the market. It's really not. You know, it's about going deeper than that. It's about the proper risks. It's about the view of money. You know, what is someone's money story? You know, what provides you safety and comfort? What do you want to be? Like, what do you, how do you want it to look? And I think those are all the big questions as we're approaching because younger Americans today, as they're getting into the workforce and going, what is an appropriate risk? What's an inappropriate risk? And how do we combat the message that society sends of spend now, consume now, right? We're a consumer-driven economy. So every most advertisements are going to be about consume, 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 so we can produce more. But it's more than just that. We have to think long-term, and it's an ongoing battle. It really is. It, it highlighted so many issues that need to be addressed with our, with our younger generations today. And I think that is a great note to end it on. So this has been fun. I could keep going, but thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you all. Chris, great to see you, brother. Yeah, it's good to see you.